uh, jump right into talking about SOLOMO. What I'd like to do is I'd like to um, introduce the panel that we have here. Um, we have uh, Vanessa Colella from uh, Citibank with us, Paul Cousineau from uh, Walmart, uh, Bill Drillette's going to join us from the Weather Channel, and Adam Kinnick is coming to us from Walgreens. So real powerhouse uh, brands here, uh, each with a really interesting perspective about this, both from a marketer, from a product, from a publisher side angle, uh, so we're, and, and, and from, a, from a retailer. So we've got, we've got a lot of really interesting perspectives. Um, and uh, excited to have you guys join us uh, and, and, and talk about so low mo. Okay, so uh, first of all, we're going to spend a little bit of time in the next hour. Uh, I'm going to kick us off doing a little bit of an overview on solo mo. I'm Mark Silva. I'm the SVP of Emerging Platforms at Anthem Worldwide, and uh, we're so happy to have you. We're very consumer focused, so that's why we we got early into looking at the signals coming from solo mo. So. Uh, Adam's going to start us off on the, on the uh, brand present presentations, talking about Walgreens programs. Vanessa and Bill are both going to uh, talk about how Citi is delivering on its brand promise through the uh, aspects of SolarMo. Uh, and we're going to um, have Paul take us really through a, a great product view and, and where Walmart's really innovating in the area of SolarMo as well. So, uh, what I'd like to do, encourage you to do, a little, a little bit of housekeeping here. I have a very friendly competition with Kevin Duhan of Red Bull about who's going to have the most tweeted session. So please, fire up the hashtag, pound solo mo, pound ad tech. Let's, have, uh, let's get active here. Let's get, the, let's get engaged. And let's stick it to Red Bull. All right. <laughs> All right. So the, um, uh, the uh, couple of things I wanted to share with you is, let's listen to this for a sec. In the original phonograph, a little piece of practical poetry. Mary had a little lamb, its feet was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. So that's Edison doing one of the first recordings in history, and uh, Neil Poston, in Entertaining Ourselves to Death, said that it, uh, ever since it's been all downhill since then. Uh, why? Because uh, news used to be about stuff that really mattered to us. News used to be about, you know, the plague that was coming your way or the weather that was going to take out your crops or other kind of disasters or things. And it didn't have to be, if it bleeds, it leads. It didn't have to be sensationalized. And ever since uh, news became, uh, you know, nationalized and internationalized, it became less relevant and therefore had to be sensationalized. That's the Postman's theory. I actually believe that quite a bit, that uh, Solomo is actually putting more meaning into media because there's nothing more relevant than what's happening around the corner of you. So Solomo itself as a construct was actually coined in, our, in the valley here, because all great things come, of course, from the valley. Uh, the, um, the, it, it came from uh, John, um, John Doerr and um, popularized by Mary Meeker. Um, it really isn't about social or local or mobile. It's about the intersection of all three. Nielsen likes to have this sort of a construct here. Uh, where they show how social and our social inclinations of sharing and of, of esteem and of commenting and rating um, really got put on steroids with the use of the mobile platform. And then um, what happened with the incredible relevancy of locality um, got added to it. So taking a look at social, we've got Zuck's Law here. And of course, um, you know, it almost feels like Zuckerberg happening before the, the, the real explosion of smartphones was, was important because uh, we learned how to share and become the largest photo sharers in the world over that platform. Um, and then when we got five and eight megapixel cameras that could actually make it really cool and do better sharing, we did that as well. Uh, we um, are going to have um, uh, some, some information from Nielsen looking at how because of social uh, and the social relevance, uh, women are actually earlier adopters and, and more uh, adoptive than males in some of these technologies. Uh, where, where, again, traditionally you would think that would be, you know, m men doing a lot of the high-tech and gearhead stuff. When there's great relevance, they're going to, they're going to, uh, the, the, the women in a lot of cases for, for uh, retailer markers and CPG brands, that means the shopper uh, largely is going to be uh, heavily using these platforms. Um, this uh, data right here is from Nielsen's Q4 Apple and iPhone, um, Apple iPhone and Android panels. And it's about 5,000 people that they extrapolate out to national trends. 28 of the top 50 apps 
have a social and local component to it. So not surprising that apps are actually really more interesting when they have that local component to it as well. These slides are all going to be up there on SlideShare, by the way. We'll, we'll share that at the end. Um, and then, you know, the three horsemen of mobile. How many of you have a, a, have a rim or a Blackberry in your hand, in your pocket? Take them out, start tweeting with them, get used to them, right? They're going to be something that you're going to showcase years to come. It's going to be really cute and nostalgic. You're going to tell your kids, we used to use this kind of device. Uh, so I don't really have good news for you about, uh, about RIM. But the three horsemen here, the, the three horsemen we're talking about is, is, is Apple and Android and Windows Phone. If you haven't seen it, Guy, Guy Kawasaki and Scoble were joking about the 2% market share. They just got started. If you look at the growth of Android uh, from 2009 forward, it exploded mainly because of the, the advertising uh, presence of Droid. You're about to say the same thing with Nokia over the Windows phone, and it's a very viable platform. And it's some of the big data that, Ka um, that Kawaja was talking about a little bit earlier is the reason why this is going to be really impressive. Also, we've just hit over 50% by almost every measure in terms of smartphone penetration. Uh, Two-thirds of every phone being sold right now is a smartphone. Um, so the tipping points happen. Remember what happened when broadband went to 50%? YouTube. So expect same sort of things start to happen here. The other thing that's happened is the smartphone's actually making us smarter. Okay, let's, that's, that's a pipe dream, but let's pretend it is. Um, but what we're doing is not just doing behavior and tension and, and, and out there doing um, uh, shopping behaviors, but while we're doing shopping, we're doing price comparison. Um, something like 70, anywhere from 70, 80%, depending on the age group, are doing this, social, um, are doing this uh, discovery. Uh, Google estimates that a third of their searches are coming through our, our local um, and, and really being heavily driven by, by this platform. Uh, we're, we're looking at a, a moment of like incredible symmetry. And then, of course, there's a tablet. So what's going on with the tablet? One is, it, believe it or not, it's a shopping machine. So uh, there's, there's a lot of um, great uh, information about uh, even the amount of retailers that were getting hit by tablets uh, over the holidays, something like 7% of all their traffic on Christmas Day and the day after were coming from there. And what people are doing on there is very much shopping behaviors. Uh, it's a platform that's growing like crazy, faster than anything else. And then, you know, Jason Calacanis likes to call this the cuddle up medium. So, you know, if you've got the lean back TV experience, the lean forward medium, a lot of this is happening, by the way, simultaneously. But when you see the difference between the phone, you have anywhere from a 300 to 500% difference in terms of what people are enjoying uh, on, on their uh, iPad versus their iPhones. So really interesting what we're seeing there. Um, and, and Paul's going to take us through some of the, the day part and some, some of the uh, accretive uh, differences that they're seeing in terms of, uh, of, of usage between iPad and iPhone and, and web. Um, the other thing I think is really interesting is you look at the simultaneous use. This is a great slide. Again, um, some good Nielsen information with our connected device report. Um, when you take a look again, the cuddle up medium, interestingly enough, you'll see somewhere down the middle there is bathroom usage. It's almost like the, it's like 50% of the people use these iPads uh, in, the, in, in the bathroom. And uh, the School of Annenberg actually has done some ethnographical and, and uh, longitudinal study on this and says that a fair amount of that's happening with toilet seat down. So it's a bit of an escape and entertainment medium, right? So obviously, everybody knows that, that the tablets have outsold the actual PCs, so Apple outsold Dell last uh, quarter, uh, and who knows, I mean, all of it's are off with the explosive growth of, of uh, the iPad 3. Uh, mobile search is growing like crazy, and we have um, it converting like crazy after searching. So the one thing we haven't had enough of is this growth of big ideas. So for all of you agency people and marketers out there, what we really want to see is more stuff like something that our agency did for Lenovo, which was actually having to filter ideas, not just by country and language and region, but does the idea actually fit every single device and locality? So I, big ideas that sit over this idea of, of a solo mo construct, I think is something that we're really looking forward to seeing more breakouts on. And then the solo mo's biggest threat absolutely has to be privacy. Never seen this threshold of awareness uh, about the privacy threats and concerns, and if you think about what Solomo is, the potential of having a creep factor of, <laughs> of people near you or around you, like Robert Scoble was talking about in terms of the highlight app, 
uh, that are approaching you saying, hey, I know you like the X-Men too. Uh, well, it's kind of creepy. It could be creepy. It could, anyway, the most important thing for all of us as marketers and advertisers is to stand tight on keeping this a very well lit and very public place. Let's not make this the pop under, pop over kind of crazy sort of uh, medium. And so that's the, that's the one thing I want to say is that, that I really believe that this, is, this, this has uh, the potential of, of, of exploding. The threshold is very low right now for, for that. People are at 60% level of uh, uh, concern over privacy. And it's not going to be just some one-off story. It's going to be the most touching stories that we're going to be shocked by. So anyway, that's a negative. Uh, it's a little bit of a negative move. The good news on this, though, <laughs> let's turn this to the positive. The good news on it is that there is a, um, uh, uh, there's a, it, just this social personal need that really makes us want to share and want to be open and want to uh, use you know, the, the, the locality and the mobility to be able to share. And so those that are well lit, like we believe Facebook's done a very good job of policing uh, this kind of stuff, are going to be winners in this space. And so with that, what I'd like to do is I'd like to have uh, each of our, 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 uh, our experts come up and talk a little bit about how their company's been approaching Solomo. Hopefully we'll save enough time for some Q&A at the end. We'd like to see, and we'll be tracking some of this on the, on the Twitter backstream if you're using the pound Solomo and pound ad tech hashtag. Uh, Adam, would you like to come join us? This is on, this is on. Uh, the uh, mic on the, on the podium this on. one. Or I guess this one's on, all right. Um, you know, Mark talked about the shortage of uh, big ideas. Um, so I joined Walgreens about 11 months ago. I think actually coming up right now on a year. And I'm a reformed agency person. Um, Bill Burnett, Fallon, Draft. And I've worked a lot in the pharmacy and healthcare space. And I'm sort of like this black sheep at the organization, right? We've got lots of folks who came from McKinsey, Boston Consulting Group, Accenture, big MBAs. Like, there's no real agency people that are there. So as you might imagine, you get into a lot of these, you know, brainstorms for ideas where you're trying to kick, you know, kick up something that's, you know, audacious and you get into different charts and filters and bubble charts that show you why this can't work and how this can't scale and this is too hard to do. And our job, our team really is focused on how do you push through that and actually kind of be the glue between the agency and the organization to bring forward uh, really big ideas. Um, so one of the ideas we're actually going to walk through, I'll kind of show you is um, actually how that started with the way everyone starts with an idea in social, which is we want it to go viral, and we want it to be a viral video. And then we say, well, great, what is viral? And they go, well, you tell us what viral is because you're the expert. We say, no, no, you want a viral video, what is viral? And that's actually where we started. And where we ended up with is something that truly is transformational um, in the space. Um, so we think in terms of social signals. Um, everything that's out there, if you think about, you know, kind of your brand um, is a signal, right? Someone leaves a comment on a website. Someone leaves your product review. Someone sends it an email. Someone likes something. These are all different signals. And unfortunately, um, they're not all weighted equal. Um, or at least they shouldn't be weighted equal. Uh, you have to really think about your strategy and your objectives and what you're trying to do with social. And we really prioritize a local signal as being one of the strongest signals that are out there. Right? We've got 8,000 community locations. And so when someone uses something like Foursquare as a check-in, that's a really strong signal. You know, whether or not Foursquare has the scale of Facebook at the end of the day becomes irrelevant because half a million likes, as Mark was saying, you're probably still cuddled up on the couch as you're liking that piece. Now I have to get you off of the couch, out of cuddle mode, into something that's actually fashionable to get into the car to go into a Walgreens. Um, that's a lot of extra steps. When you're physically in the store giving us a signal, that's a really, really, really rich data set. Um, so when we think about solo mo, there's a couple things here, right? On the location side, it's where I am and it's what I'm doing. That's what we look for. So which lo Walgreens location are you in? Or are you actually, are you near something that's near a Walgreens location? Um, and what are you doing? Are you coming in there just because you need to pick up photos? Is it something that, you know what, you just need to come in and you need Pepsi? Or is it a prescription? And all these different things become different, right? As you might imagine, Mark was talking about privacy. How many of you want your prescription information out there, you know, as a social sharing piece? Probably no one, right? Of course not. Um, but when you're coming in for photos, photos is a natural kind of intersection of things like that. And actually, there are ways to make healthcare um, fashionable, social, exciting, uh, without sharing your prescription information, which we never do. Um, and on the most side, right, you've got things like apps, right? So there's our Walgreens app. That gives you location information. There's platforms like um, on the so side, like Facebook, um, Foursquare, Path, um, which we're kind of thinking about right now. 
Um, there's things like SMS and real-time marketing. So all these different things come together. And you can see that when, when they actually come together, and I was alluding to Mark earlier today, and I said, unfortunately, a big part of solo mo hasn't been realized at the end of the day. Right? Think about the last two years, three years, four years. Think about the number of actual, true solo mo experiences you've personally had. It's social in nature where you want to share it, you want to tell someone about it, or you're using social data. It's location specific and that it's mobile. It's few and far between. And you know, we're constantly looking for a way to kind of reach this holy grail of solo mo, and a lot of that it really hasn't materialized of yet. But we think these three areas, with these types of signals, provide the right opportunity to provide value back to a customer. Um, so we looked at tapping in natural behaviors, and this is a really big part of the strategy that we have. It's not about a specific network, um, although there are some networks I prefer more than others. Um, you know, it's about the right behavior. And you have to think about the different persona groups that we have. You know, it's not just even demographics. It's how someone might interact with the Walgreens across the board. And we have to look for what's the natural intersection of where social behavior takes place, that it actually works in the mobile environment, and that it's very location and contextually specific. So what I want to serve up is an example of something that we actually launched last November um, that uh, I'm really proud to say that the team kind of worked on this, just came back from New York, picked up four Shorty Awards, in addition to kind of three or four other awards that we've won for the program. And it was the first really big initiative that we launched um, after I had started. And like I said, it started with, we need a viral video, and it ended up here. I think hopefully after you kind of watch this, you may agree that we ended up in a much better space than a viral video of you getting a flu shot. Influenza causes thousands of deaths each year. Numbers that a simple vaccine can help prevent, if you have access to it. Walgreens wanted to ensure more people did by pledging over $6 million in flu shots to those in need. And for the first time ever, we put the power to give away those millions into customers' hands. For one month, when a customer checked into a Walgreens store via Foursquare and Facebook, we promised to donate a flu shot to someone in need. Within hours, fighting the flu went viral. Social conversations lit up Twitter, the blogosphere, and Facebook news feeds. Nearly half of participants shared their check-ins, encouraging others to get involved. Sharing exposed the campaign to over 12 million people within users' networks alone. Once the program was in swing, Walgreens owned almost 72% of the flu conversation over competitors. And we didn't stop there. We also gave Facebook users the opportunity to tell us who would receive the most flu shots. A full spectrum of notable causes gave visitors the chance to choose what was important to them and help others with a click and a quick vote. And vote they did, over and over again. The voting page garnered nearly 200,000 visitors in one month's time. Page likes quadrupled. Program engagement climbed and stayed consistent from day one until the campaign's close, proving that social was the best fit for activation. And all the emphasis placed on the necessity of flu shots did exactly what Walgreens intended position the store as the go-to for preparing and protecting your family this season. Walgreens stayed top of mind as the flu shot headquarters and increased sales during a vital period. It goes to show, people love to give to companies that give back. Ultimately, Walgreens successfully made fighting the flu and fighting for a cause go hand in hand. So I think that's a lot better than a viral video of you taking a video of you getting a flu shot. Um, which, you know, again, is like where a lot of things start from when you're a new organization. You know, 11 months ago, we didn't have a social team. Uh, it wasn't a defined organization. There wasn't a right way to kind of work through things. Um, but, you know, kind of giving you some real data on it. Um, and we talk about the meaningful piece. When you look year over year, um, you're talking almost a 500% increase year over year. Um, you know, a significant increase. When you look at share of voice, 70%. Um, and usually in a category where, you know, honestly, it's a non-emotional thing. Like you think, oh, God, I have to go get a flu shot. Like I really want to go in and get, you know, stuck with a needle. Um, but, you know, what we kind of looked into, the persona groups, again, we looked at that natural behavior. We knew there was altruism. We knew that people really wanted to be able to do good. Um, and kind of the biggest actually kind of like tipping point was to kind of give you an idea of why we knew the program really resonated. Um, before the program, we had about a 70-30 split male-female people who were checking in at a Walgreens. Uh, which, as you might imagine, is a little bit discongruent with what the core Walgreens shopper looks like. After the program, it flipped to 60-40, female to male. 
So we not only grew the base of check-ins, not only grew the number of people walking in through a Walgreens store, not only grew a specific business area like flu shots, we actually brought new people into the fold who now actually have stuck with us throughout. We actually haven't seen a dip off at all in kind of check-in behavior. So it was a program that really stuck with people. Um, this data actually comes from Visible Technologies. That's who we use on all things social media monitoring. They're phenomenal. Um, and to kind of give you an idea, in, in 2011, it was about 63% between us and CVS. And after that, it was about 84.5. Um, the data point that's actually shown in the video takes into account us and every single other organization that can promise and or serve a flu shot. So you've got your Rite Aids, you've got your independent pharmacies, you've got your targets. If they can serve it up, at the end of the day, we had almost two-thirds of the entire conversation that was out there. And why the conversation becomes important, to, obviously, you might imagine, is because it's an awareness piece, right? Like, you're not thinking flu shot top of mind, but as you see it percolate to the top of your news stream or your feed, you start thinking about it and you start walking into a store. Um, we call these types of programs, so being an agency guy, um, the first question, of course, was what's the ROI of everything social? And I said, okay, great. Well, if you can give us enough budget to fund a study that proves the value of the like, I can tell you what the value of the like is. And they were like, well, okay, that's a fair pushback. And we said, but I said, let's not get out of, let's get out of the weeds there. We came with this concept that we called Return on Amazing. And Return on Amazing actually has a qualifying set of rules for what a program at an amazing scale looks like. It has to be able to impact the store. Uh, which is the first thing. If it just lives online, it serves Walgreens.com, it doesn't even qualify at all. And the reason is we have 8,000 community locations, you know, we have to be able to figure out a way to get people into the store. And an amazing program has to fundamentally change the way that we do business. Um, you know, that's not a social campaign, that's truly thinking about social in a very business-oriented context. And when you think about this type of a program, fundamentally change the way that we handle flu shot donations, a national program that we had never done before in terms of accepting check-ins, working with Foursquare. Um, what we fundamentally believe with, with Amazing as a concept, how many of you want to work with a non-Amazing organization? Like, how many of you actually would rather work with a company that says, we will actually be audacious, we'll be bold, we'll try things out, we won't tell you, we'll prove it out. Just tell me why it's going to work. No, no. Like, how many of you want to work with a company that says, we'll take the risk? And when you do that, you get better talent, you get partners who will give you exclusives. You get partners who will give you alpha level access to different things that are out there. Amazing is a really powerful concept when we think about how it impacts the org. And then the final piece of how we have a criteria for it, it has to impact multiple groups throughout the organization. And this is key. If you can get four, five, six, seven groups focused on a really big idea, it gets tough to kill the idea is the first thing. That's actually one of the things I learned working with Crispin. Um, you keep an idea big enough, it's really tough to kill. The second thing, large-scale ideas can actually be moved into marketing mix models. You do something that's really small, tough to fold it into a traditional marketing mix model. You do something really big, you can actually see the impact and tease it out. And I can tell you without giving you the actual number, this program delivered at a return that was more than 20 times worth what it actually cost to execute. Um, that's an amazing program. Um, and what we've kind of continued to do as part of amazing uh, two weeks, three weeks ago, we were the first retailer to ever be able to bring in a scannable barcode into a Foursquare check-in. So that's actually something we've been working with Foursquare for about six months. And they said, look, your commitment to innovation, your commitment to doing things different, we want you guys to succeed. And we're happy to basically help you figure out a way to try things out. Now, it's mutual, right? They want to be able to try scannable barcodes at check-in. We want to be able to do it because it provides inherent value to the customer and yet another reason to actually go ahead and check in. So um, with something like this, we actually have an exclusive for a defined period of time because we were first, because we've continued to invest in Amazing. So there's the social business design of it. There's low so mo, but there's also how you bring in great partners to amplify low so mo. Great, thanks a lot. Yeah. Bill and I practiced, but we didn't practice how we're going to share the mic, so you'll have to bear with us as we see how this goes. Um, I think Adam said a bunch of really important things. I'm going to try and breeze through the context pretty quickly here, but I came to Citibank about two years ago, obviously a you know, really, really tough time for an institution that's been around for 200 years. And so what I wanted to start out with is to give you a bit of context as to what we were trying to do with the brand and what we we're trying to deliver. Because to me, the key in Solomo isn't a one-off campaign, even if it's great. It isn't you know, a one-time deal. It's how are you doing something that has sustained impact for your customers and how are you delivering value? For us, just one of the pillars that we think about when we deliver value is 
For us, banking doesn't really start and stop at the branch, and it doesn't really start and stop online anymore. Right? We, we have a real commitment to be the world's digital bank, and the reason for that is twofold. One, you're all living and, and breathing and interacting on your digital devices every day, and oftentimes, whether you're trying to save time because you realize on the go that you forgot to pay a bill, or you're just trying to waste a little time while you're waiting for someone to see, well, gosh, did, did I spend more this month on groceries than other people like me? That that's the kind of place that you often want to interact. Um, but Citibank is also in the US and many places around the world less of a large mega bank, where what you call a super regional bank, means we're not in every location. And for us, it's a business imperative to make sure that we're doing as much as we can do digitally. And so I think that's really critical for how you think about something like Solomo. It's got to be something that fits into the imperative of the business. Otherwise, it tends to be an add-on or something that is a nice to have as opposed to something that you need to have. Now, when we think about how are we going to deliver value for consumers at City, we really frame it as how would we reimagine banking for the way you live. And the way I like to think about that is, you know, every day, each and every day you wake up, whether you're thrilled about it or you're really annoyed about it, you're going to probably need money in some way, shape, or form during that day. Right. You may pay by credit card, you may bum 10 bucks off of a friend, um, you, may, um, you may pay with your smartphone, like using the Google Wallet, but something during the course of your day, unless you're on vacation in a really beautiful spot somewhere far from San Francisco, is going to require money. But the reality is you don't want your bank following you around, tapping you on the shoulder, reminding you that they're the enabler to everything that you're getting done. So we like to think about it that 90% of the time, you want us to be simple and streamlined and in the background, right? Because you don't need us to remind you that we're helping you get something done. You don't need us to remind you that we happen to have been where you deposited your paycheck. You just want it all to happen seamlessly. And so we've done a lot of work in trying to improve our ability to deliver seamlessly and in that streamlined fashion. But at the same time, 10% of the time when something happens, you really care about your bank could be really negative. You're traveling overseas and you've lost your ATM card or your credit card, and man, you want someone to pick up that phone in a nanosecond and find, you know, make sure that they get that card back to you. It uh, could be something really positive, like you've earned enough reward points that you bought tickets for two to Paris or you, you know, fulfilled a wish that you had for a long period of time. And we really try and balance out those two things. How do we deliver simplicity and how do we deliver rewards? So what I wanted to do, if you'll indulge me for a second, is show you two of the big, broad awareness spots that we've been running that are largely on the reward side. And then talk about how we really partnered with Weather to take that from big, broad television campaign to, well, what does it mean for you each and every day? Put this on. Hook that up. I got it. Careful with this. Whoa! You got a weather balloon with points. Yes, I did. It all started when I got this new city thank you card and started earning loads of points. Three, two, one. It turns out you can use your city thank you points for just about anything. says it's supposed to be around here. There it is, right there. So I used my points to get a whole new perspective. <laughs> the new City Thank You Premier Card gives you more ways to earn points. What's your story? City can help you write it. So I'll just show you one more with the idea that what we're trying to do on a lot of these big, broad awareness spots is show how points, in this case reward points, might be meaningful to you individually. And then we'll get to what we did with weather. My boyfriend and I were going on vacation, so I used my city thank you card to pick up some accessories. A new belt, some nylons, and what girl wouldn't need new shoes? We talked about getting a diamond, but with all the thank you points I've been earning, Somebody left the gate I flew us to the rock I really had in mind. The City Thank You Card. Earn points you can use for travel on any airline with no blackout dates. 
So as part of how do you tie all this together, what I found is there's some stuff in solo mode that I can predict, and that's a really tiny slice. I didn't make the pie chart because it's embarrassing. It's a really tiny slice, what you can predict in this space, and some things that you really can't predict. Um, that commercial, that second commercial, ended up having a ton of viral activity. People really interested in the woman who's a climber and the song. A lot of, you know, where was she? What's the location? How do we get in touch with her? Um, but not really something we could predict. We do try and take a really serious look at who are partners that we can work with, that we can really work with to bring social, mobile, and local together to drive that engagement when it's not just a movie that you're watching on television, but something that really matters to you. Um, so Bill's going to take us through a little bit of what we did with the Weather Channel. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, so this is really interesting times, right? So when we were looking at our social media strategy, we've already um, really embraced local and mobile and have been doing a great job. And if you really think about it, before Al Gore invented the internet and before Steve Jobs put the internet in our hands that carry with us every day, people have been talking about weather. It's a common topic almost everyone talks about and socializes about. So um, when we made a commitment to social, we looked at what is our strategy? It's really about engaging and connecting everyone who's talking about weather on any device. So when we started working with Twitter on a partnership, there was one core value we both shared is we're both in real time, right? Twitter's happening every single day. Weather impacts lives every day. So we're able to build a great integrated partnership and brought Citibank to, to be our sponsor to help bring that conversation to life across many devices and provide a two-way conversation where there's value and there's um, full awareness of what's happening, right? So um, the integration lives on our website and it lives on all our mobile devices and it's integrated into our television program with our on-camera meteorologists talking about what's happening from a professional standpoint and then bringing in the conversation and what people are talking about on what they did with severe weather or great weather and really got some great findings. So we're gonna walk you through um, what some of that means. So um, we launched this in um, August of 2011. Um, now we had no idea that Mother Nature, who is the best at building a reality show, um, was gonna provide a bunch of really unique weather circumstances. So if you look at the data, we started seeing about 100,000 tweets a day happening as people were engaging on a local level about how their weather was impacting them. And then all of a sudden, we had an earthquake in New York. Now I'm sure you guys that live here in San Francisco get a little earthquake shake, no big deal. Well, in New York, crazy. So um, one of the tweets here uh, from the Sexton group, um, you know, this gal said, the weirdest moment seeing the people I'm following in DC tweet earthquakes seconds later it happened in New York. There we saw a huge increase, over 95,000 tweets happen immediately, people concerned about their loved ones and how to handle that circumstance. And then the mother of all storms, Hurricane Irene, was bearing down on the East Coast. Um, we're covering it from all angles. Many people are going to be displaced. They're not going to know where to um, find shelter, where to get water, where to get cash in need. And we saw an enormous volume of tweets, over 700,000 um, happened in one day. And what's interesting is a lot of the color in those tweets was a helping people find shelter or find resources. And um, another event that happened, they call it Snowtober now. We had about two feet of snow in the Northeast that just pounded us with trees full of foliage. Almost as much damage and power outages as the hurricane. And again, we saw an enormous uh, flow of tweeting activity and that two-way conversation was happening and it was all enabled by a platform where people were using a mobile device or if they had internet access to find out what they can do to handle the circumstance. So locally, local relevancy matters um, when it matters the most, right? So we talked about the impact of, of, of a hurricane and how that displaces people and how can we leverage a two-way conversation? I think City did an amazing job here as people were either losing electricity, displaced from their home, City was actually actively tweeting on a location basis when they were gonna shut their branches in preparation for the storm and then where they had access to their money when they needed that money to get water, shelter, et cetera. And we saw an enormous uh, commitment from City to get that information out on a social platform where people on a location basis could actually take advantage of it and actually enrich their lives. 
So I'm going to walk you through a couple of uh, creative examples here of, of um, how personally relevant um, creative actually helps drive some success, which we'll share with you in the end on, on some of the engagement. So this is an example of the week leading up to Labor Day, right? So it's the last long weekend of the summer. Um, this lives online and on the mobile device, surrounding people on location as they're preparing for their weekend, they're planning, they're looking at information, what's the weather gonna be like? City reminds you, you can leverage those thank you points to make it the best uh, Labor Day ever, to continue the summer, to invest in your barbecue or a new bathing suit, whatever those needs are, it's giving the context in the ad to that planning mindset at scale, whether they're online or out in the field with their, with their mobile device. And again, when you look at this, I think this is a great example. Three different cities on the same day all experiencing different weather conditions. So in Los Angeles, it's going to be beautiful out. We dynamically brought in the weather into the ad unit and then dynamically served cities messaging that goes along with that weather. So in Los Angeles, it's going to be beautiful. Get outside, enjoy a, a live event. Um, in Chicago, it's starting, winter's starting already. Why don't you plan that warm vacation? Use those thank you points. And then in Philadelphia, it's raining. It's gonna be a, a crappy weekend. Why don't you stay inside and get that holiday shopping taken care of? So um, relevancy helps drive results, and we'll share with that with you shortly. Um, so what did we learn? So from a social standpoint, um, we saw on weather.com and on our mobile devices that um, people were spending um, twice as much time on the site when they were engaging um, in social weather. When they were actually tweeting, it went up to three times. So really big engagement from, from a social standpoint. Um, and then driving local engagement and simplifying consumers' lives. We just looked at those, those ad creatives. When you bring a relevant message and provide value, you see a really uh, big increase in the ROI from an advertising perspective. We saw this up to 400% lift in click-through rates where people are actually clicking through and taking advantage of those points that they've gathered. Um, and also, um, you know, when you think about weather, um, very similar to, to what uh, Vanessa talked about, being there consistently for people, there's that 10% of the time when it's really severe, we get enormous spikes in traffic. And same when people are planning for holidays, those are also great opportunities to take advantage of those engagement metrics and drive home the ROI. Um, and then finally, um, you know, when you're surrounding consumers, no matter where they are um, and enriching their lives, we saw an incredible lift in brand metrics um, from a mobile perspective, almost three to four times um, impacting brand metrics. And then um, when it came to purchase intent, a 250% lift, and then 116% lift in message association against all industry norms. So we felt this was a really powerful campaign with a lot of connection and a lot of great learnings. And it helps us work with City as a partner to define the markets that matter to them, where their consumers are, and bring them a relevant message and provide a value exchange. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. <laughs> you know, it's, it, it's amazing how often we, we hear the, this ongoing story about overperformance, and it's not just because we're focusing on, on uh, solo mode today. It comes back to that sense of meaning that happens when, when you're hitting things at the right time. Speaking about the right time, okay. let's talk about Walmart and place. Hi, everybody. Um, now, I know you guys have been, we've been talking at you for half an hour and uh, also uh, it's been a long day, so I'm going to try and bang through these relatively quickly. Um, Paul, you go ahead and use the mic over there. This yep. right over here, and here we are. Um, so uh, I come at this from, uh, you know, that we talk about this intersection. I come at this intersection really from the mobile product side. That's my, what I do at Walmart. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how we think about mobile products and how they impact our business as a whole. Um, we have people that engage with our products in sort of three different spots. They can engage with them directly in our stores. You see somebody here, stand, and we're talking about that, scanning something in the store. People can be engaging with a mobile product at their home or on the go, wherever they might happen to be, or they might be in that lean back mode or the cuddle up mode we were talking about in a tablet. And so that's a very, three very different experiences that lead to different problems. But if you think, or different, different experiences you want to deliver for a customer. Now, if uh, right here we have this thing about mobilizing.com, and this is the, the three things that we think about when we look at 
What are our goals and what are our priorities? Walmart has a very strong online presence today, and we want to, you want some mobile version of that presence, whether that's on a, um, a smartphone as a website or as a mobile app or on a tablet. So all these things are very relevant, and that's largely a translation exercise. We have a very concrete target to shoot at. But you also want to think about mobilizing the store experience. And at that you think about, forget Walmart.com exists as an online destination, but just think about the fact that when you walk into a Walmart store, and I'm, I hope most of you have done so before, it's a daunting task in some ways. It's a large location. There's a lot of products there. And you think about, okay, I got a smartphone in my pocket. How can that make sure that I have a better visit? Whether that's everywhere from getting me to the store, finding my items in the store, make, helping me decide which product I want to engage with, which product I want to pick, or actually facilitating the transaction. And even the normal layperson on the street will answer that a smartphone can definitely help with all of those things. And so the challenge for us as Walmart is to understand how can we, through the Walmart app or the Walmart website, provide the right level of resources for that customer to help at each level of those, uh, at help each of those phases in that customer's journey through one of our stores. The final thing we think about is really here it's called accelerating multi-channel. When I talk to customers, I don't talk about channels. Customers don't engage with channels even though we think about them in retail. They engage with the brand and they just say, look, I want to get something from my Walmart. And you think about how can you actually make that as seamless an experience as possible for this customer. So this bill just walks through thinking through a planning experience at home, uh, finding your way to that store as I talked about earlier, performing that, the barcode scan indicative of actually um, uh, what, what I might perform in the store. And I'll talk a little bit about one of the products that we've launched that really is engaging that customer in store. Thinking about the payment activity, there's tons of um, activity in the area of mobile payments. Um, but there's a lot of uh, complexity in that, and I think uh, uh, happy to touch a little bit further on that when we get to the Q&A. And then thinking about that experience of the customer, you know, recognize that this receipt here can be delivered to you electronically, and today you get some minimal amount of experience around that. You can get your email, you get it emailed to you, but think about a much richer experience where the data from your offline shopping experience is equally available to customize that subsequent experience as it is in online. We have done a very great job in the online world of using that data about the customer in a, uh, a privacy appropriate way to help that customer you know, make better decisions on their subsequent purchases. We don't do a great job of leveraging that stuff in the offline world, but we think all those techniques are equally applicable rather than just putting up an end cap and hope somebody sees it. Um, you can customize that experience to the customer, and that's where a lot of the, the solo mode type of activities, certainly on the local side, happen. And that's what those people up there, I guess, are, are personalized experiences. Um, uh, just to give you a little background about the products that I've worked on to date. So um, today we have um, you know, the group that I work with, which is based here uh, locally in San Bruno and is part of the At Walmart Labs team, has got products in the US looking uh, in a mobile web, uh, Android, iPhone. Uh, we also have an iPad application. And these are servicing both the online and that store customer. Um, we also have a business in the UK, uh, and we've done an iPhone app um, and mobile website there. We have a very thriving, very different business. Uh, Asda has a very thriving grocery home delivery business. It's like web van, but successful. Um, and it's, a, it's very different dynamics in that market. Uh, you have, you'll see a lot, of, uh, a lot of Tesco, ourselves, and others have just the different geographies and different, um, uh, it's, it's really been a great success for us. And that just drives a very different experience. When you're coming to a general merchandise site and you're, you're looking at that, uh, that's very different from uh, how you're going to be dealing uh, a very recurring weekly type of relationship that involves you know, picking a time slot of when you want your things. We get a lot of engagement. Customers will create their weekly shop in their trolley, those are the terms they use, um, at the beginning of the week or even beginning a two-week slot. And then they'll go back over the course of those two weeks and continually go, oh, I forgot to get this. Oh, I forgot to get that. Oh, we're out of this. And that just drives a very different experience for that customer. And so that's been a great experience to try and learn about. And as we, we Walmart has businesses in um, 28 different countries. We have more model, mobile products as a company, um, but these are the ones that I've had personal experience with working on. Um, one of the things, this day park comparison is really thinking about how people use products differently over the day. And what I wanted to try and drive towards that, this is industry knowledge, talks about how people use things differently during the day. But what I wanted to talk a little bit about, which is a related topic, is really thinking about those three original things I, uh, I mentioned, which were you know, the, the ad hoc, casual use, 
uh, on a smartphone on the go, the lean back type of experience of a, a tablet, and the in-store use, and how that actually influences the different products that you build across the portfolio. We think about, for example, that our mobile website is much more of a search-driven type of experience and much more of an M-commerce-centric experience. Whereas, you know, I started out at Google searching for a TV, I'm at Walmart.com, I'm in, I'm out, I'm a first-time customer. Whereas the app is very much, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, whether it's the iPhone app or the Android application, both of those applications are very much for the loyal Walmart shopper. You first have to convince them to install the application. You want, and when I started to start searching for a TV on Google and I ended up at Walmart, I don't want you to get in my way and say, well, please go and download the app in order to find out about it. You want to service my, but if I'm a customer who shops at Walmart every week as a grocery shopper, which is a large portion of our business even in the U.S., I want a very different experience there. I want a lot more device capabilities, and I want an app that remembers me and is very personalized. Um, when you think about the tablet in the middle, what's really there, a tablet experience, again, very different from the smartphone. You don't want um, the same experience blown up, and you don't take your tablet with you to the store very often. A few people do, but not very many. You want an experience that's as rich as your desktop experience, but you want it presented to you in a much more touch-friendly, lean-back, casual, browse-centric as opposed to search-centric environment. And so for us, what that's meant is that if you look at our experiences and the feature sets that we focus on in each one of these applications, they become quite different. And that's not always appreciated when people think about mobile as one, one category. So I wanted to pick one specific example. And one thing thinking about here, how do, how, do, how do people engage, brands engage with Walmart customers and try and bring that into it? What we really focus on is solving customer problems, but that's not necessarily orthogonal to that brand engagement. So we started this shopping list uh, capability, which we launched last fall. And what we, what, the reason I have this talk now thing up here is when we looked at shopping lists, we, we knew from data that somewhere between 75 and 95 percent of our customer base, when they walk into a Walmart, come with some kind of list. It's a big place. You don't want to forget anything. So um, and the question was, how could we get those customers who have that list scribbled on a piece of paper to commit their list to us in the smartphone application? The two things we focused on were, we're competing with pen and paper. It's incredibly easy to use. So we wanted to make our application as easy as possible to use and leverage technology there, but then add as much value as possible. So some of the things we did was we did voice dictation in a bit of a unique way. I invite you to try this. We take a whole stream of, of voice input, and we use our, our database of groceries to improve or target a little better the voice recognition. So you can say eggs, milk, cheese, orange juice in one stream and, or read your whole list out, hit the button, it'll recognize all of those and parse them into the five or ten items that they are. And we're smart enough to know that orange juice is one thing and not two and to give you that kind of experience. So we really focused on that ease of use. Um, so there's, there's how we, we'll parse all that out. Um, we'll also add as much value as possible. So we said, we'll tell you, is it in stock in your local Walmart? What aisle is it in? Um, what is the price going to be at that local store and give you that budgeting tool, which is incredibly important for our customer base, really looking to save money, working on a tight budget. And so those were things we looked at in terms of that add value thing and were things that would never be provided by a paper list. And then finally, um, we, get, we look at also figuring out more ways to save. Now, Walmart is always focused on everyday low cost. We're not a we call a high-low provider. Um, but we do offer customers as many ways to save as possible, whether it's through our, our rollback, which are really permanent price increases that are, are savings so that we're passing on to the customer in an everyday low-cost way um, or everyday low-price way. Or also, we do accept manufacturer's coupons. You go to any Walmart, you'll see coupons. We gladly accept them. So we look for a way to actually showcase coupons inside the application that are targeted to the customer. This person's asked for some eggs. We'll, that we'll, we'll show a, a group of coupons that are egg related and or in that general category that the customer can then clip and then add to their shopping list, providing them more ways to save. Now all of this information you talk about, we we're talking about Solomo, so where's the intersection? Well, our experience is inherent in retailing, is inherently local. The prices vary by store. As do the, um, as do the, obviously the stock status, um, and even the coupons that are available and the offers we're going to sh share, share to that customer. So we use the customer's location to try and target that experience and vary it by store. On the social side, most of the social things we've done with our at Walmart Labs team um, is really, uh, and this is a group of the people that um, that uh, have come together and formed Walmart Labs. So Cosmics is an is a company that we acquired uh, last spring. And they have uh, one of the examples I wanted to bring forward for them was really 
something that we done launched in the uh, in the fall called Shopee Cat, which is a very interesting experiment on Facebook to try and look at what are how can we use social signals and your social network to find better recommendations for what you might want to buy. So it's a gifting application that uses a social graph to drive recommendations uh, for your uh, for your friends. It's right now is a Facebook application, and we spend a lot of time sort of tweaking the algorithm. If you've used it or if you try and use it over time, you'll see that the recommendations are getting better and better. And this is an experiment we're making um, to try and understand what is the right recommend use of social signals in something recommend recommendations in retail. And as you can see, as that gets more mature, we'll obviously bring that into the mobile commerce experience, being able to surface that um, inside and then also add the local element, which is easy to do once you're on a, a mobile device. We do some level of that targeting uh, on Facebook already, but um, it's much more granular to do from a customer standpoint of what are the items in this store that your friends would like. Um, and that's where you can sort of see the trajectory of. The one final thing, I'm a little bit over our time here, but the one final thing I did want to touch on is why are these logos up here? Is, Mark asked me a little bit before the session about, okay, well, Walmart, it's a large scale organization. This is obviously a very innovative uh, area, an emerging area. How do you try and, uh, you know, uh, merge the scale of a large company like that um, with the experimentation required to be successful in an emerging area? And one of the, the way we've tried to create a structure and environment for that to be possible is through this Walmart Labs concept, which is based here in the Valley, which is composed of being grown it both organically. I, I was hired directly into uh, the, the Walmart Labs team. Um, but we have uh, acquired a number of small companies to help seed the DNA of innovative companies. And we've been given the latitude, which is as demonstrated by ShopeeCat and some of the things we've done in mobile, to experiment and try new things, which we can then take the successful things and scale them up to um, um, you know, all our 4,200 stores or, or over um, 10,000 places that we have worldwide that customers interact with us. There you go. Thanks much. All right, when you get this group of uh, experts in the room and this much IP here, I don't really want them to leave without some questions. Um, I'm going to put it to you guys first. I've got some on my own, but anybody ha have a question they'd like to ask of this uh, panel, they'll probably, uh, they'll probably forget more about uh, at Solo Mo. Come on up here. Here we go. Then uh, most people will uh, learn in a lifetime. Here you go. And introduce yourself. And uh, Andy Myers of AJ Advisors. Uh, just a quick question for Paul. Uh, how do you track, uh, uh, first of all, how do you give out the coupons? Uh, and then second of all, uh, kind of across the board, is how are you tracking the social interaction at various levels? What tools are you using? Thank you. So, I mean, I, yep. that's right. Um, we have okay. to hand this mic around. There you uh, go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um, the, on the first one for the coupons, uh, this is a, uh, today, just uh, at the... You actually have to, and this is one of the, the uh, coupon industry is a, um, one that I've learned a lot about over the last few months. Today, the, in order to bring your coupon, you basically email your coupons and you bring a piece of paper with you. And you basically bring them to the register and they scan them just like they would a physical coupon. So digital coupon redemption is something that is actually more complicated from a reconciliation standpoint on the back end uh, than it is uh, in terms of, hey, can you get something can you get, show an image on my uh, phone that I can scan at the cash register? Although there's some issues there too. Um, so we're actively moving towards eliminating that uh, you know, physical step uh, and moving towards a digital redemption model. Um, the second thing you asked about was how we're tracking social interactions and what tools we're using there. Um, and I don't, have a, I don't have the best answer for you to be able to talk through which tools we're using on that social side. Um, there's a ton of metrics that are getting thrown off by all of our experiences, both social and uh, and mobile. Um, and most of the stuff we're doing, frankly, right now, particularly on the mobile side, is mostly in-house. Um, we found that, you know, uh, a big database and a guy who's good at, um, you know, at, at handling uh, either SQL or Mongo queries is probably one of the best assets we've had. A lot of the tools we found for tracking impact that are off the shelf, particularly on the web space, um, haven't translated particularly well. So we've done a lot of the, the data mining and data analysis in-house. Let me put a question to Vanessa about the, uh, y when I think about city and I think about those big television spots, I'm thinking about a large scale organization, but then how you had to be able to respond in real time to the events that Bill was talking about. How does, a, how does an organization as large as city and it's all of its agencies learn how to act that way? I'm thinking about for all the marketers in the room. Yeah, I, I think it's probably one of our bigger challenges, which is you've got to fly the plane, right? And that's a huge amount of marketing that has to happen at any given time. And then to be effective in this space, you've got to be nimble. And 
not all of our processes at city, let's say, are set up to be nimble. And so how do you make sure that you've got a group of people internal and our agency partners who are really understand what the long-term vision is and what we need to get done, and then are willing to say, hey, we, we've got something that's going viral here. We think that this, is, this hurricane's gonna be a big deal or not. How do we move on that quickly? Uh, one thing we've done is we've integrated all of digital. Uh, we don't have separate teams that work on television and print versus digital. We also don't have separate teams that work on social. Uh, that's true both in the marketing organization and in the service organization. So we interrupt about a thousand conversations a week on the web. That's on Twitter, it's on Facebook, it's on many popular blogs. When we see people are having challenges with City, you know, can we help, can we take you to secure chat? And part of the way we've been able to increase our ability to be nimble is by integrating that, right? We, we found that you can't do that if you put all those people in a separate organization because they can't feed anything back to the, to the bigger organization. Whereas by integrating both digital, social, servicing, we're able to really close the loop from listening in the social space back to how do we service and ultimately how do we market to people. But it's not an easy, it's not an easy problem to solve. Thanks. And Adam, um, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, when you think about solo mode and the ability to scale, uh, you need big data. You need, you know, the weather channel-like kind of events going on. You need, um, you need uh, big data like uh, Google has or like Facebook has. Um, and I'm thinking that, you know, few platforms actually, as you were saying, really hit the solo mo thing all the way. But you guys have been experimenting a lot on, on Foursquare, for instance, doing some advertising, doing some, and by the way, I want to congratulate you guys all for not bringing up the word QR code here. Thank you. But, uh, <laughs> but just one, I, I, I'm amazed we got through it without it. But let's, um, let's talk about uh, what you've learned on Foursquare for the marketers in the room, handful of lessons that you've learned along the way uh, uh, in advertising on something that, again, is as specific as a platform. Sure. Um, so I think there's two things. Um, one of the, the big reasons I think we were so thrilled to have scannable barcode technology in Foursquare, if you've ever tried to redeem a Foursquare special before, it's like tap it, unlock it, show it to someone, maybe they key it in, they go, what the heck is this thing? I have no idea. But when you have a barcode, even if you have no concept of what Foursquare is, if we didn't do our job at all at educating the folks at the store level, they see a barcode and they go, let's see what happens if I scan it. And they scan it and it works and basically it's seamless. And no one is kind of ever the wiser. So really focusing on the simplicity of the experience. I know it's an overused term, but if you think about a lot of things you were kind of talking about, like the coupon redemption piece, like absolutely, right? Like, you know, print it off, make sure it's printed on the right paper. You know, hopefully it was the right ink that you used. Maybe it scans, maybe it doesn't, but this was like completely seamless. It's two steps. Um, like you just check in, unlock and scan. Um, this is the first thing. And I think the second thing was, um, there's a great penchant to want to um, work with scale. Facebook, for example. Yeah. Um, have you ever tried to get someone on the phone at Facebook and say, change your platform? <laughs> exactly. Um, so we kind of try to pick our battles. And it's tough to argue with 700 million people, though. Um, it is, yeah. um, who are, I believe you were saying, cut up on the couch. Yeah. Um, but you know, I mean, when we think about kind of those, those signals, we said, wow, here's a partner in Foursquare who is just as equally as fascinated by advancing their platform as we are. And they said, what, what would it take for our platform to be something that you would use it on every type of a program? And you have to look for those right partners. And I mean, literally to the point where we pushed them on their roadmap to bring out scannable barcode coupons, and we were their guinea pig. And we wanted to be their guinea pig because that was part of the amazing aspect of what we're trying to do. So, you know, there's, there certainly is an inherent desire initially to want to work with the largest ones. Remember this, just because you're the largest doesn't mean that you're the best for what your business or what your program needs to do. Well, that's great. And speaking of signals, I think we're hearing the signal that the party's starting. <laughs> and and <laughs> please, please join me in, in thanking the panel for doing an excellent job. Probably the best solo little presentation I've seen. Thank you guys very much. A couple of other housekeepings. If you want to get the slides, they're at bitly.adtech slash solomo. Uh, anybody uh, need some follow-up from our team, Anthem people, raise your hands. Feel free to talk to the folks from the Anthem team. Thank you very much.